Hi everyone, Michael here, Vegan Space Scientist. Today I'm going to be doing a response to Cosmic Skeptic's video on can you answer these tricky moral dilemmas. I was asked to do this video by a friend of mine who watched Cosmic Skeptic's video and wanted to see how I would uh, answer the same questions and approach the same moral dilemmas. So basically what this is, we've got, it looks like a quiz with 19 different moral scenarios that you have to answer how you'd act in each one. No right or wrong right answer, it's just looking at how you would react to different moral situations. I haven't done the quiz yet, so we'll be doing this. Um, this is completely live, and uh, I also haven't watched Cosmic Skeptic's video. So I'm gonna take the quiz myself, and then watch Cosmic Skeptic's video, and uh, I guess react to it a little bit. Uh, just one thing I wanna talk about quickly is the third paragraph here, which says you should respond with what you think is the morally right thing to do, which may not be as the same as what you would actually do. And I think this is really important distinction. I guess one example would be, would you um, choose to save your mother's life or the lives of 10 other people uh, who are strangers? Now, you know, it's, all, it's well and good to say that um, you know, the, the morally right thing to do here, uh, or at least from my uh, utilitarian hedonic perspective, is probably in the thought experiment world to save the 10 lives. Now, having said that, I don't know how I would actually act in that situation. It, it may well not be to do that, even though I want to want to do the most morally right thing, as hard as it would be for me, as hard as it would be for people around me to know that I made that decision. But that's uh, that's the kind of distinction we're making. So we're trying to um, we're trying to say uh, answer with what is the most um, correct thing to do rather than what I would do. And I guess the one way that I like to think about this quickly is just what have you behind the veil of ignorance? So. If you don't know who you would be in this scenario, if you don't know if you're going to be the person making the decision, if you don't know if you're going to be the mother, and if you don't know if you're going to be one of the 10 people, uh, how do you make a decision that, um, uh, I guess, most benefits you in that situation? And that's how you should act. Uh, or that's how you should, um, you should want to act, at least. The other thing, it says, several questions talk about moral obligation. In this activity, you... To say you are morally obliged to do something means that you must do that thing in order to behave morally. So when the the moral obligation is strong, that means that not doing what is obligated is a serious wrongdoing. When the obligation is weak, failing to do what is obligated of you is still a wrongdoing, but not a serious one. You pass someone in the street who is in severe need and you're able to help them at little cost yourself. Are you morally obliged to do so? Uh, well, I think you are obliged. I mean, I think... Um, in, in the, my my interpretation of the word ob obliged has always been, I guess, that if it's going to if it's going to reduce suffering or increase well-being, then you were obliged to do it. So I mean, I, I I don't know if I see a distinction between the strongly and weakly obliged. I don't know how to deal with this. I feel like wherever I'm given the choice, I'd want to just say strongly, no matter how like you know, if it's like, are you obliged to pat a dog if it's going to give you if it's going to give the dog a lot of pleasure and take you like one second uh, I mean I think still strongly obliged even though it's a very small effect relative to some other things like I don't know if I'm thinking about this the wrong way but I don't see much of difference between like strongly and weakly obliged I'm just going to say strongly obliged for this one uh, you have a brother you know that someone has been seriously injured as a result of criminal activity undertaken by him uh, you live in a country where the police and legal system are generally trustworthy are you morally obliged to inform them about your brother's crime. This one's a little bit trickier. Um, so let's just think about this. If I inform the police, what's the effect of that? I mean, if my brother is the sort of person who is causing harm, not informing the police would probably, you'd have to suspect that that would mean that my brother would be likely to cause some future harm. So I think I would be obliged to tell them i mean i'm just, the, the only reason i'm hesitating is just because i i mean i don't think laws i think laws are sometimes different to what is morally um obligated for example there, there are there are laws that um well there, there are things that i think are unethical that are legal and vice versa so um but generally speaking i'd err on the side of following the law unless there is like some unjust law. But in this case, I think I think I would just be obliged to tell them just because I can't think of any strong argument for like not telling them in this case. I don't know, am I overthinking these? Um, question three, so do you think that assisting the suicide of someone who wants to die and has requested help is morally equivalent to allowing them to die by withholding mor medical assistance? Assuming that the level of suffering turns out to be identical in both cases. So, so assuming I guess that they're perfectly 
um, mentally capable of making that choice, they want to die, is that equivalent to allowing them to die by withholding medical assistance? So I think, I think in a lot of places in the world where voluntary euthanasia is not legal, it seems like this is from my relatively unformed perspective, but I think in a lot of cases you can withhold medical assistance, which means you allow them to die, but you can't assist them to die. So I, I, my, my like view on these kinds of questions is I don't think there's any morally relevant difference between an action and an inaction. If they have the same effect, if they have the exact same effect, then they should be the same. It doesn't matter. I mean, there's no difference between, uh, there's no ethical difference between killing someone and not pushing a button that would save their life. I mean, the result is that they die in either case. It doesn't matter that you're, you know, the one not choosing to not press the button is still a decision as much as killing the person would be. So in this case, I can't see any difference. Same, same level of suffering in both cases. I mean, that makes it even easier. Is morally equivalent? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You're able to help some people, but unfortunately you can only do so by harming other people. The number of people harmed will always be 10% of those helped. When considering whether it is morally justified to help, does the actual number of people involved make any difference? For example, does it make a difference if you're helping 10 people by harming one person rather than helping 100,000 people by harming 10,000 people? I, I can't think of any reason why. It's about the... Oh, actually, hang on. Hmm. Actually, if I help... So if I choose the... Let's say the choice is between 10 people... Help 10 people to harm one or help 100,000 and harm 10,000. In the second case, you're actually, you, you know, the net benefit is you've helped 90,000 people, assuming the pain and pleasure that, you, that is happening here is like equal and opposite. Let's make it easy and just say like you're reducing suffering in 100,000 people and you're causing some, that same amount of suffering in 10,000 people. So just make it like totally easy. Well, the second, in the second scenario, you're doing more good, right? Uh, or am I mis misreading the question? Morally justified. Does the number make a difference? I think it's morally justified in both cases. Uh... I don't know how to. I don't know how to answer this. Does does my does my hesitation make sense? Because the percentage, the like the percentage difference, or the relative difference is the same, but the actual absolute difference is different. So in the second case, it is it is more justified. No, I mean I. Uh, I'm gonna say yes, but I might just be misinterpreting that or overthinking it. You own an unoccupied property. You are contacted by a refugee group which desperately needs somewhere to house a person seeking asylum who is being unjustly persecuted in a foreign country. Your anonymity is assured. You have every reason to believe that no harm will come to your property. Property, Are you morally obliged to allow them to use your property? Okay, what happens if I don't offer them asylum? I would assume they'd go back to their country, foreign country and be persecuted. I feel like this is a pretty easy one. They're being, un you know, they've made it quite easy with the question wording. It's they're unjustly persecuted. Um, you know, it may well be illegal to, uh, house them. Is that even, is that even the case? You're contacted by a refugee group. Yeah, I, d I don't even know if it's necessarily illegal to, to house them. At least, you know, from my country's perspective. That's, that's what I was thinking. I, 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 yeah, I think, I guess I'd be strongly obliged. The only, my only hesitation would be, it's like, how deep do they want me to read into these thought experiments? Because, you know, it's an unoccupied property. If I rent out that property instead of housing, the refugee, maybe I can use that money to save many, many human or non-human lives. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to like try and address most of these questions at like the direct level rather than getting too meta on them. Cause I don't think that's the intended, um, what's intended, but I'm just going to say strongly obliged to do so. Assuming that you, maybe you can't rent it out or something. A charity collection takes place in your office for every, uh, 10 pounds given a blind person's sight is restored. Instead of donating £10, you can use the money to treat yourself to a cocktail after work. Are you morally responsible for the continued blindness of the person who would have treated, um, been treated had you made the donation? Yeah, absolutely. 100% responsible. I don't see how you could look at it any other way. Like I said, um, I think that an inaction is just as much an action as in any action. So, I mean, there's no moral difference between um, literally stealing... 10 pounds from that charity and not giving the charity. This might seem like a harsh and kind of, I don't know, over the top uh, way of thinking about ethics, but I mean, it's it's true. Like what is the net effect of having a cocktail instead of donating 10 pounds? It's that one more person will be blind. I don't understand how you, I mean, it, it's like, unf it's, it's like 
it feels unfair to think about things that way but i think that's just that's that's the net effect like what can you do about it yeah like people might see that as too demanding but too bad i guess so yeah responsible uh, all right one more thing i want to say in that last question is um i mean having said that i do sometimes spend money on things um i just accept that that's selfish and i can't justify that like is it like i spend money on things that i don't need for like my own pleasure um you know i spend more time playing video games and i probably should you know i could be doing other things that might help save people's lives or reduce suffering but you know i i just uh, i accept that i'm selfish in some ways i don't try and justify it by saying oh well i'm not obliged to you know do that like my net the net effect is that i'm causing suffering like i can't uh you i don't know how you can deny, deny that uh someone you have never met needs a kidney transplant you're one of the few people who can provide the kidney would any moral obligation to provide the kidney be greater if this person was a cousin rather than a non-relative okay so all we're answering here is you're going to donate this kidney anyway this, the, the question here is just if you're choosing to donate a kidney to a stranger versus a cousin is there any moral greater moral um obligation in one case or the other I, I feel like yeah i'm pretty sure this should be no it, it shouldn't matter really who they are because you know they're, they're still just as morally worthy uh of the kidney i just my only hesitation comes from like is there something i'm missing where does the fact that they're your cousin like have some practical relevance that would affect this question i just can't i can't think of anything i'm sure maybe there's something that might have a small effect but i'm gonna say moral obligation be greater no it's not you can save the lives of a thousand patients by cancelling 100 operations that would have saved the lives of a hundred different patients are you morally obliged to do so so it looks like 100 operations are lined up to save 100 patients i can cancel those and save a thousand patients instead yep i mean uh, it looks like a lot of these questions are following the same thread of action versus inaction you're absolutely morally obliged to do so i think sorry to the 100 patients but i mean if you flip the scenario would you say would you you know if you had a thousand surgeries lined up operations are lined up to save a thousand patients would you cancel that to save 100 patients clearly not so i think you should do you know i don't think it should be asymmetric in that sense are your moral obligations to people in your own country or community stronger than those in other countries and communities assuming no unusual circumstances for example blah 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 because of suffering in your own country or community are moral obligations stronger to those people in other countries at first i was thinking no you know the moral obligation to everyone should be the same this question is not worded how i expected it to be worded i thought it might be asking like do you think people in your country are more more you're more morally obliged to to help people locally and people far away and the answer to that i think would be clearly no but it's kind of flipped why would my moral obligation to people in other countries and communities be stronger than people locally i mean i don't i think i, I disagree with the, the first premise anyway i think everyone is equally morally worthy <clears throat> regardless of location but are they are they implying that um people in my country tend to be more well off and that i should be more morally obliged to donate to, to, to help people overseas we'll say like a dollar goes further or you know people were more some more suffering so that some help is more effective than the same help in in my country so no unusual circumstances no suffer uh, suffering because of famine either in your ah oh, it, okay it looks like they're just implying that all countries are the same i'm really confused how could given this like clarification how could it be that someone in another country has more you're more morally obli obligated to help them i don't understand but no i think you deliberately sabotage a piece of machinery in your workplace so that next time someone uses it there will be an accident which will result in that person using the losing the use of their legs are you morally responsible for their injury um yeah of like that that one's really easy because <clears throat> what do you think is the what do you think is the net effect of sabotaging a piece of machinery it's not like it's a surprise i mean you know it's it's pretty you have to expect it's pretty likely that that's going to result in some harm where it might get trickier is am i morally responsible for like kicking a rock on the sidewalk by accident or let's let's say purpose. If, I, if i kick a rock on the sidewalk on purpose and it rolls away and then someone later steps on it and sprains their ankle and falls over and breaks their neck am i morally responsible for that i think it's fair to say that i caused that but it wasn't intentional and i wasn't informed in any way about what the um you know what the effect effect of that might be so in that case i wouldn't be responsible but i think in this case it's like unless for some reason you just have no idea that sabotaging a piece of machinery like can harm someone 
uh, then I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, definitely responsible. You know the identity of someone who has committed a serious crime resulting in a person being badly injured. Are you morally obliged to reveal their identity to an appropriate authority so they are dealt with justly? Strongly obliged. This seems like the brother example. It's, you know, if you don't reveal their identity, it sounds like they might harm someone again in the future. So, strongly obliged. You can save the lives of 10 people, 10 innocent people by killing one other innocent person. Are you morally obliged to do so? Let's go back to the, we, get, we go back here to the clarification I made at the start, which is, it's about what, it's not necessarily what you would do. It's what's just most ethical overall, veil of ignorance and all that. Um, this just seems like a trolley problem kind of thing. So, save 10 innocent people by killing one other innocent person, like, yeah, yes. The flip side of that would be, would you save one innocent person by killing 10 people? No way. Um, yeah, I mean, inaction is the same as inaction and all that. So, yeah, yeah, I think I have to go for save the 10. You see a charity advertisement in a newspaper about a person in severe need in Australia. Uh, there is no state welfare available to this person, but you can help them at little cost yourself. Is there a good reason to believe that any offer, any help you offer will make a difference? Sorry, you have a good reason to believe that any help you offer will make a difference. Are you morally obliged to help the person? No state welfare available. Help them at little cost to myself. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I'm going to assume that I can't do anything else with the money or I can't do anything else that's selfless with the money. I mean, if I can donate, if I can like, if I have the choice between spending this money on myself, giving it to this person in Australia, or I don't know, like saving, sparing a hundred animals from being born into a life of factory farming, like I'd choose the, the last one. But if it's just the choice between the first two, which I think is what they'd be implying, then I would be strongly obliged. And again, I'm going to try not to read too much into this, although that's that's probably too late for that, but strongly obliged, I think, to help that person. You're required to send a person a gift, and you have bought a bottle of drink to send them. However, you discover it is poison, and if consumed, will cause blindness in the drinker. How does that happen? To replace it with a non-contaminated bottle will cost you 10 UK uh, pounds. You give the poisoned gift drink as a gift anyway. Are you morally responsible for the blindness of the drinker? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, am I misreading this? How could that possibly be construed any other way? If So I've already bought the drink to send to them. I haven't sent it yet, it looks like. I discover it's poison, okay. Cost me 10 pounds to replace it, and I give it anyway. I mean, if my if I have a choice of, like, just not giving the gift... Or saying, if I've already sent it, just being like, hey, that gift I sent, by the way, just found that it's poison, please don't drink it. How could I, how could you possibly not be morally responsible for this? A situation arises where you can either save your own child from death or contact the emergency services in order to save the lives of 10 other children. You cannot do both and there is no way to save everyone. Which course of action are you morally obliged to follow? Yeah, I mean, morally obliged to save the other children, the 10 other children. That's not to say that's what I would do. I mean, not that I plan on having kids, but if I did, uh, well, I mean, let's just, let's, I can think about someone else. If someone else saved their kid over 10 other kids, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be totally surprised and I wouldn't necessarily hold that against them. But having said that, I think it's still the less morally, I think it's still the less ethical choice to make. And having said that, I think people make this choice all the time whenever they spend some amount of money on their kid to increase their enjoyment and happiness a little bit when they could have donated that money to, uh, you know, spare multiple kids from uh, risk of malaria or something like that. Um, you know, people people do this kind of choice all the time. And just because it's like uh, like uh, an inaction, so to speak, I don't think that matters. Yeah, I mean, going back to the clarification at the start, it's it's pretty clear this is what is like most moral to do. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I would do it, um, even though I, I want to want to do it. But in the moment, I may not want to do it. You can save the lives of 10 patients by cancelling one operation, which would have saved the life of a different patient. This just seems, this sounds like the same as like so many other questions. So yes, morally obliged. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. You own an unoccupied property. You're contacted by a welfare organization, which desperately needs to house a person from a nearby town who is being unjustly persecuted. Your anonymity is assured. You have no reason to believe that. This, again, this sounds, I don't see how this is really any different to the other question with the, um, with the refugee. Morally obliged to allow them to use your property. Yep, strongly obliged, assuming that I'm not going to be able to rent this property out and make money and save more lives. You become aware that a piece of machinery in your workplace is faulty and that if it is not repaired, then there will soon be an accident which 
will result in someone losing the use of their legs. Despite knowing that nobody else is aware of the fault, you take no action. Shortly afterwards, the accident occurs. Someone does use, lose the use of their legs, so you're morally responsible for the injury. This is like even clearer than the other machinery example. Because of the other one, you sabotage it. I don't know why you sabotage it, but you know you you think it's possible. Like you know, it's it doesn't it doesn't specify that you know it's gonna like harm someone. You just like it's just like well, what do you think is gonna happen when you sabotage machinery? That's you know you might harm someone. This one is like you know that there will be an accident and it's gonna harm someone, and then you do nothing. It's just it's just the inaction versus action thing again. In in any in, in action is an action. You're absolutely responsible. And the last question, you can save the lives of a million innocent people by killing 100,000 others. Are you morally obliged to do so? Uh, absolutely, yes. By the way, with all these questions, we're assuming that um, we're assuming that like saving lives is a proxy for reducing suffering. Uh, I know I know it can be a lot more complicated than that, um, but let's just say like we're, we're just obviously assuming that like saving a life is reducing suffering overall. Morally obliged to do so because would flip it around would you kill a hundred would you kill a million people to to save a hundred thousand others no way simple as that all right interesting they they break down my morality so my moral parsimony score is 71 percent. i actually don't know what that means what does this mean moral frameworks can be more or less parsimonious that is to say they can employ a wide range of principles which vary in their application according to circumstances less parsimonious or they can employ a small range of principles which apply across a wide range of circumstances without modification, more persimmonous. An example, let's assume we are committed to the principle that it is good to reduce suffering. The test of moral parsimony is to see whether this principle is applied simply and without modification or qualification in a number of different circumstances. I would have thought I'd get, I mean, I would have expected I'd get 100% then for that. I mean, my, what I want to want is more suffering is bad, less suffering is good, does not matter. Nothing else matters about the scenario. So what did I answer that uh, ended up giving me not 100% on that? Supposing, for example, we find in other uh, otherwise identical circumstances, the principle is applied differently if the suffering from is from suffering persons from a different country to our own. This suggests a lack of moral proximity because a factor could be taken to be morally relevant. Huh. Did I misinterpret some questions? Because from this explanation, I would have expected 100% moral proximity. Hmm. Well, maybe I'm just not a, as morally proximitous as I expect. Yeah, you know, high score is suggestive of a moral framework that comprises a minimum minimal number of moral principles that apply across a range of circumstances and acts. Weird. I'm I'm a bit surprised by that. Yeah, did I did I miss something? Please do let me know in the comments because uh, I would have expected 100% from that. Um, or if you know specifically which question I answered that, which question I answered like differently that led to this score, then let me know. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to watch um, Cosmic Skeptics video and look at how they answer their questions and I guess make some comments on that. So the first question is one that I think will be quite familiar to viewers of this channel. You pass someone in the street who is in severe need and you are able to help them at little cost to yourself. Are you morally obliged to do so? Now you might be surprised at how I answer this question. I've spoken a lot about the ethics of charity and the ethics of reducing suffering where we can, especially with relation to veganism. And so you might think that I can quite simply answer this question by saying, yes, if you're in a circumstance where you can help someone who's severely in need at a comparatively low cost to yourself, you should always be obligated to do so. But we must consider the implication of the word obligated or obliged here. To say that you're obliged to do something is to say that it is wrong of you not to do it. In any circumstance like this, where someone's suffering severely and you can help them at little cost to yourself, it is always wrong of you not to do so. Now you may think this is true, you might think of course it would be wrong of me not to help someone in severe need right in front of me at little cost to myself, but we must consider the implications of this. The fact is that since we live in a world that is infused with incalculable amounts of suffering all over the globe, and we also live in a world where it's incredibly easy for us to help these people due to the existence of charities, which now, given the internet, you can donate to these charities simply by logging on on your computer. Whatever device you're currently watching this video on, you could just open a tab, go to a charity like Oxfam, donate some money, and have a very real effect on people whose lives are severely in need of help. But here's the problem. If we say that if you find yourself in a situation where you can help someone who is severely in need at a comparatively lower cost to yourself, it is wrong for you every time that situation comes about. You are obliged to help them. It is wrong for you not to help them. Then we have to consider that 
there is never a time that you are not in that situation. Right? Because of the fact that charities exist and they operate 24-7, you can always be donating money. And the fact that there is an endless supply of suffering people on planet Earth, you are never not in this situation. You are always in the situation where you can help somebody by uh, a significantly less cost to yourself. By, I mean, that just, sure, that, that's, that's true donating some money to these charities. If we say that you're morally obligated, morally obligated in any situation where someone is suffering severely and you can help them at comparatively little cost to yourself to help them, if you say that that is a moral obligation, then that means whenever you find yourself in that circumstance, that's what you have to do. But we're always in that circumstance because we can always help somebody by donating to charity. What that means is that, you know, you shouldn't be watching this video right now. You should be opening another tab and donating to charity and doing that practically all the time because you're never not in the situation where someone's suffering severely somewhere in the world and you can help them simply by pressing a button and sending them over a bit of money. Now the problem with saying that this is an obligation that we all have is that it will completely upend the way that we all live our lives. For instance, it becomes obligatory that you never, never again eat out at a restaurant or never ever again buy a new book that you don't really need to read. Things like this. Okay, so uh, it looks like he's still got a while left in his answer, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump in with some thoughts here. Um, I'm kind of assuming where he's going with this, so apologies, cause of skeptic, if I um, I'm jumping the gun and you're actually gonna ask this question differently. But it looks like he's leading up to saying that because um, you know acting this way, thinking that that action is morally obliged, is so demanding if we apply it to just our everyday life that we're not morally obliged to do it. I think my response to the obligation, question of obligation, or things being too demanding, I guess, is it's just like, well, too bad. Um, if we accept that suffering is bad and well-being is good, yeah, it's like, it's going to be demanding sometimes. That doesn't make it less bad to reduce to, that doesn't make suffering less bad and well-being less good. Uh, I don't, know, yeah, I, I don't know if I can, I just don't feel like this is relevant. And also the inaction versus action thing. I mean, let's let's just take this scenario and flip it. Like he's talking about having a, enjoying a meal out versus, versus donating to help someone. Just flip it. Like, would you cause that suffering to someone to enjoy a meal out? And I don't think Cosmic Skeptic would say yes to that. You know, I don't think he'd say that's justified. But then you have to say that the flip side is you are morally obligated to do that. Like, you know, people are still going to eat out from time to time. It's, uh, I do. And I, you know, I, I accept that that's, that's unethical. And I, I just cannot justify it. Like, I, I'm genuinely not justifying those actions that I take in my life. There's, I still think they are unethical. Like, it's going to increase suffering. How could I possibly justify that? Flip the scenario. You know, like, how I, how I act in the flip scenario would be different. But that doesn't make it any less or more justifiable. Like, you know, I wouldn't um, cause that suffering to someone to enjoy a meal out. But for some reason, when it flip it around, I'm more willing to do that. I don't think there's an ethical reason for that. I think I'm just selfish and acting within social norms. That's not a justification. So, I mean, this whole thing about uh, demandingness, uh, I just, I just, I, I can't get around it. I don't know. I, I just, I think I disagree with Cosmic Skeptic on this one. But let's, let's continue and see, make sure that he's going where I think he's going with this this because that money that you spent could have gone towards helping somebody who is severely suffering and so it would be quite a little cost to you comparatively to give up that meal or not read that book if you can buy a malaria net which may actually save someone's life somewhere else in the world but because we live in a world where this is always a possibility there's always more money that could be given it means that you essentially would commit yourself to selling all of your non-essential possessions so maybe you'd be allowed to keep your house you might need um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. It depends on how you look at the question. The way I was interpreting those questions was you were acting on the margin. Hmm. And was I? Maybe, hmm. maybe that's not quite right. Let me let me flesh out what I'm thinking here and then I'd work out if I agree with it or not. Let's say right now I walk down the street and I, you know, I, I see a scenario where I can spend $10 to save a person's life. Like, yeah, 100% morally obliged to do that. That's not to say that I should give all 10 of my dollars of all of my assets all the way down to where I have zero dollars. I think that's, I think that's something different, which is, and then this almost feels like a slippery slope fallacy where Cosmic Skeptic is implying that if you, if you're going to do it in, in the like marginal scenario, you're going to do it, you, sh you should therefore do it all the way down to you're bankrupt and have nothing. But I don't think, I don't think I see it that way. 
you know there there might be some there might be some level where even from a purely selfless ethical perspective you should stop giving ten dollars to save lives because you know it's going to stop you from you know it might, it might be unsustainable you might burn out or you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things but for for the average person like you can almost certainly go ten dollars down more to save one life and really not experience too much hardship so like on the margin it's all i think it's almost always the case that not giving the ten dollars would be uh bad doesn't matter if it's a little bit demanding you know but that, i don't think that's quite the same thing as saying you should get you should then sell your house and go all the way down to zero dollars assets like i think that's something different having said that it could still be the case that giving that last ten dollars to save that one extra life is still morally obligatory because let's say you have ten dollars to your name and let's say giving that ten dollars is not going to cause you to die you would just be you know severely under under severe hardship it's still it's a choice between a bit more hardship for you and someone dying so i mean i just that's why that's why i'm like i'm not sure and i was kind of like speaking out like thinking out loud here um i think i'd almost like bite just bite the bullet and all of this and just say well yeah too bad <laughs> that's kind of my response uh, i'll continue on now to downsize it though because you don't need that big of a house um, you probably wouldn't need to buy a car because you can probably get by by getting the bus or cycling or something like this you can never really buy books you can never buy a tv you've got to cancel your netflix subscription you have to get rid of everything that is strictly not essential to your life because somebody else suffering and genuinely severely suffering and possibly on the brink of death surely that suffering is going to be far more important than the suffering that you'll receive from you know not watching netflix but i think our intuitions tell us that this isn't a fair thing to ask of somebody it may be virtuous i don't th i don't like i don't think intuitions are a good way of addressing at the core questions um i mean yeah i don't know for somebody to sell all of their non-essential possessions and give them oh and the, and the question about fairness like it's unfair so what like this universe is so unfair it's so unfair that i have to give up my sunday to go and do let's say like some kind of street outreach to stop people from harming non-humans like i don't want to be doing that i would much rather be at home playing a game or going out climbing or something like something i intrinsically enjoy because I don't intrinsically enjoy like activism and street outreach. It's that's really unfair, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it. It's like it's ethics is not driven by what's fair for for me to do. That's I think that's am I am I the misunderstanding cosmic skeptic or I just deeply disagree with them here. Money to charity, but I don't think it would be fair to say that they're obligated to do so. Right? Clearly, it can't be an obligation in my view, because otherwise there would be no books behind me. I'd have sold them all. And no, I don't. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. I mean, you can be. They they clarified at the start of the quiz, which Cosmic Skeptic didn't go over in his video, but they clarified very specifically. Morally obligated is what is morally correct, like most ethical to do. It doesn't necessarily mean what you would do. Just because Cosmic Skeptic has all his books behind him and has, you know, living in a building, presumably, doesn't mean that. It isn't morally oblig um, ob he's not morally obligated to do the thing, uh, to s to sell that stuff. Those those are separate things. Given the money to charity, so how do we kind of square these intuitions that we feel? Well, I think this all has to do with the wording of the question. Right, the question asks: You pass someone in the street who is in severe need and you are able to help them at little cost to yourself, are you morally obliged to do so? Now, I would say that although we have an obligation to kind of, at, as much as we practically can, help those who are suffering at little cost to ourselves, we can't say that in any given situation, you will have a moral obligation to help them in that situation. I think we have a moral obligation overall to help a significant number of people in this kind of situation, but you can't say that in every instance of that situation, you're morally obliged to help because if you do you're led to this conclusion where you can basically never do anything ever again because you're spending your entire life giving money to charity so we can say that you have a general moral obligation to sufficiently help the suffering but it doesn't follow that in literally every situation where you have that opportunity you have to do so now some of you out there might be thinking well hold on if you don't think it's an obligation to you know try and prevent this person's suffering in every circumstance what about the implications for veganism right does that mean that every so often i can have a bit of steak or you know have some eggs or something because you know i have a general obligation not to cause suffering but i don't have to do it in every given situation
No, these are different. And the difference here is that in one case, you are committing harm. And in the other case, you're allowing harm to continue or to happen. So when you pass someone in the street. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't expect them to say that, but they yeah, they, they just see a different, they generally just see a difference between actions and inactions. And I just, I fundamentally disagree. Uh, I've, I've explained why I disagree already, I think, in, when I was taking the quiz, so I, I'm not going to rehash it, but yeah, I just, I, I'm kind of surprised, actually, that that's, that's where he's gone, but I just completely, completely disagree. What can I say? And they're severely suffering, and you can help them, but you don't. You allow them to suffer. You don't cause them to suffer. Whereas, when you buy an animal product, you are literally the... One of the reasons I'm so surprised is because I thought Cosmic Skeptic was open to the idea of wild animal suffering and reducing wild animal suffering, you know, uh, suffering that is naturally caused in the wild, not by humans. But I thought, you know, he would say that we should reduce that suffering. Uh, I mean, I watched his, I watched, I remember watching his talk with um, uh, Humane Hancock a while ago. I could be misremembering what his view was, but that's what makes me so surprised by this because I thought he was saying that we should do that. If, if it's just about action versus inaction, as, as it seems like CS is saying, then how could we ever be, like, how could we ever, what, for what reason would we want to reduce wild animal suffering? There would be no reason because we're not directly involved. Ah, I don't know. This just seems so strange. The reason why animals will be being killed and tortured and harmed, because by paying for this stuff, you're demanding that it continue. It's not the same as allowing these animals to suffer. You're actually causing it. And I think this is a relevant distinction. I do think that in all circumstances where you can avoid causing suffering, you should do so. But I don't think that it's an obligation that in all circumstances where you can prevent someone from suffering, you have an obligation to do so. Now, I think there are some circumstances in which you do have an obligation to prevent someone from suffering, but I just don't think that we can say it as a general rule that any time you find yourself in this situation, you're obligated to help. Sometimes you might be obligated to help, depending on the specifics of the circumstance, but I don't think we can extract from this a general broad principle, as someone like Peter Singer does, that this means that any time we're in that situation, we must be similarly obligated to help and thereby because we are always in that situation given that there are always people suffering who we can always help at considerably less cost to ourselves, we must always do so. I think that would destroy our lives and I think we would all agree that it would be too much to ask of a person. So with those caveats in place, I think I have to go with not obliged. Question number two, you have a brother, you know that someone has been... Yeah, I mean, general wrap up of question one is I just disagree. Yeah, that's it and seriously injured as a result of criminal activity undertaken by him. You live in a country where the police and legal system are generally trustworthy. Are you morally obliged to inform them about your brother's crime? My intuition here says yes. Of course, one can psychologically understand why it would be more difficult for someone to turn in their brother or a family member that they care about, but I think the question is getting at this idea that, you know, Considering that, generally speaking, if we know someone has committed a serious crime that is worthy of being punished, um, we should turn them in. You know, can we allow ourselves to make an exception because if it's our family member, it's so difficult for us to turn them in? Um, no, I, I don't buy this for a second. I, I don't think it matters if this person is your brother or your mother or just a stranger on the street. If they've committed a crime that genuinely deserves punishment, then I think you do have a moral obligation to report that. Now, I think, of course, there are exceptions to this for unjust laws. Uh, the question makes this very clear. You live in a country where the police and legal system are generally trustworthy, but it doesn't specify that the, the legal system is kind of accurate and properly tracks morality. For instance, you know, if in the United Kingdom the police and legal system were generally trustworthy, but they had a terrible law that said that, you know, if you read a particular book, you should be thrown in jail, then no, I don't think I'd have an obligation to turn that person in. So I think we also have to assume that the laws are just. And I think that in this instance, if somebody's been severely injured as a result of criminal activity, we probably agree that that activity was unjust because it caused this suffering, in which case I think you have as much obligation to turn your brother in as you do a stranger. I think that's what the question's getting at. I think by specifying it's your brother, I think it's trying to get at this idea that is there some difference between turning in a stranger and turning in your brother? And I have to say that no, there isn't in my view. Um, okay. I mean, I th it sounds like I pretty much agree on that. And I think that was a good point about, um, you know, the, the police and legal system could be trustworthy, but there's some law that just doesn't make sense. Like the book example. I mean, yeah, I disagree with that. I, sorry, I would agree with that. Um, I'm trying to work out, is this inconsistent with his answer to the first question? Cause he's saying you would be morally obliged to do that, but it's not like you're causing the suffering with your inaction. I mean, 
you know, it's not like it's not like you're doing something that you then are morally obliged to not participate in. Is that is that like contradicting his first answer? Feels like it might be. You know, there's some cost to you to to do that. There's some cost to you to like uh, tell the police about your brother. It, you know, you might have like con confliction and regret. Uh, your family might be a bit upset. Your brother might be a bit upset. There is some cost to that. I, I don't know how... I don't know. I just don't see how that's particularly different to the first question. But they seem... From my perspective, they seem to answer that differently. Question four. You are able to help some people, but unfortunately you can only do so by harming other people. The number of people harmed will always be 10% of those helped. When considering whether it is morally justified to help, does the actual number of people involved make any difference? For example, does it make a difference if you're helping 10 people by harming one person rather than helping 100,000 people by harming 10,000 people? This question is absolutely fascinating. Right? You may have thought, as I thought when I first read this, that the question was about to ask uh, whether it's permissible to harm some people to help a larger number of people. But that's not what it's asking. It's saying, does it make a difference if you're harming one person to save 10 people or harming 10,000 people to save 100,000 people, right? The proportions are the same. You're helping 10 times as many people, but does the actual number of people involved make a difference to how we should morally judge this situation? I think the answer to this question is going to depend on your views about rights. For example, if you're a utilitarian, and utilitarians famously have trouble grounding rights because they only care about the consequence, they have a much less strong view of rights than a deontologist might, right? A deontologist might say that you have particular rights, like a right to life, a right to liberty, that cannot be infringed upon, right? No matter the circumstances, you have rights that cannot be violated. Whereas a utilitarian might say that what we care about is not the protection of people's rights, but the maximization of pleasure, right? And so if you're a utilitarian, all that really matters is the calculus. It's the calculation of balancing pleasure over pain. And so if both situations in terms of their calculation are the same, it's like you harm 10% of the people to help 90% of the people, I don't think it matters how much you scale this up or down. For the utilitarian, they run the calculation, they find out that the proportion is going to be the same, the proportion of people helped to harmed, and because it's just about the consequence, for the utilitarian, I don't think it would make a difference. If you harm one person to save 10 people, you're equally justified to harm 10,000 people to save 100,000 people. Hmm, interesting. So they went a little bit, they went they approached this question a little bit differently to I did because I, I thought that was my first thought but then I thought about the fact that in one scenario you're just actually like the net effect is just greater is better and so that therefore you would be you know uh, it would be more good to to, to save more people um, yeah I guess he's just approached that a little bit differently but I think like overall in the general you know I generally I, I kind of agree with what he says I just think we interpreted the question differently maybe it's the same thing. But if you believe that there do exist such things as rights, I think this complicates matters. Because a right, by definition, in my view, is inviolable. Right? To have a right to something means that it cannot be taken away from you. It means that that thing is yours and nobody can infringe upon it. Nobody can violate it. That's what a right is. Now, rights always have correlative duties. If one person has a right to something, it means that other people have a duty to respect that right. If I have a right to life, it means other people have a duty not to kill me, for example. What this means is that if I have a right, for instance, to not be harmed without my consent, then if somebody else does harm me without my consent, they're failing to discharge a duty. Right? They're, they're violating my right and they're violating their own duties. If you think that rights are genuinely inviolable in this way, then what that means is it doesn't matter how many people you're saving. You cannot harm somebody without their consent. If they genuinely have a right not to be harmed in such a manner, it do there's no consequence that could possibly justify violating that right. Because by virtue of it being a right, there is nothing that can justify that kind of violation. Now, people who think this way do run into problems. For instance, the ticking time bomb case, right? If uh, there's one person on planet Earth who knows the location of a bomb that's about to explode in Manhattan and kill thousands of people, and the only way to extract the information of where that bomb is from them is to torture them, if somebody thinks that that person has a right not to be tortured, it means that there's no circumstance in which we can absolve ourselves of our duty not to torture them. And so by torturing them, we're doing something wrong. What this means is that in the situation where the only way to find out the location of the bomb is by violating someone's rights, 
we can't violate that person's rights and we need to allow the bomb to go off. For a utilitarian, this is an incredibly troubling prospect, right? It's like, we're really going to allow thousands of people to die, not to mention all of the property damage, just to kind of protect this one person's rights? Well, for the person who believes in rights and thinks they're genuinely inviolable, yes. And the way that someone who thinks this way would characterize the situation is... The problem I have with, um, I, I don't necessarily think Alex is, uh, Cosmic Skeptic is putting forth this view. I mean, he's just explaining it. Maybe we'll see in a sec if this, if, you know, they say this is their view. But um, the, the problem with this is, you know, those other people also have a right to not be blown up by that time bomb. And so my the, my problem I have sometimes with deontology is they should be they should they should still be consequentialist about it like why would you not want to maximize the number of people who don't have their rights violated you know you, you so it's it's still making the choice between violating one person's rights the person you're going to torture to get the information about the time bomb versus the rights of hundred like however many people it was who were going to be blown up by the time bomb. In any case, the, the example I always go to for why I think rights are useful but not inalienable is that ultimately no sentient being cares about rights. Um, they might think they do because rights tend to be a proxy for reducing suffering and getting more well-being. But the clearest example of this are non-human animals. You might think that non-human animals have inviolable rights, but non-human animals can't possibly care about their rights. The only thing they care about and can care about is having less suffering and having more pleasure like think about it what how could they possibly care about anything else so i think humans are just have like added some extra steps in between to convince themselves that they care about rights like i think rights are useful i just don't think they're intrinsically valuable so i mean that that's like my, my ultimate objection to it but even if you did go down the right of thinking rights are in inviolable why would you not want to maximize the number of people whose rights are not violated they would simply say that the person whose job it is to extract the information is not responsible for the deaths of the thousands of people when the bomb finally goes off, right? The person who is responsible for those deaths is the terrorist who planted the bomb, right? The person who refuses to torture the man with that information is not responsible for those deaths. He's only responsible for whether or not he tortures the man with the information. I don't think that's right. I think, you know, same thing, inaction versus action, and that can apply just as much to deontology, I think, as it can apply to utilitarianism. Um, they might not, a deontologist might not agree with me, but I, I think they're wrong. <laughs> but again, like, just like how I say sometimes, you know, people, uh, a sentient mind doesn't care, uh, especially for non-humans, so they don't care about whether their suffering is caused naturally or whether it's caused by someone intentionally. They don't care. They can't care. In the same way, I don't think a person would care whether their rights are violated by one person versus another. So... For you to not violate the rights of one person to in order to save the rights of thousands of other people, uh, is that not just deeply selfish? Uh, I, I want someone to explain to me how that's not just incredibly selfish because you're you're choosing to put your own ethical purity in the deontological sense ahead of saving the rights of thousands of people. Yeah, how is that not selfish? So, uh, I yeah, I would just disagree completely with that perspective. The blame, that is to say, for the bomb going off lies solely with the person who planted the bomb with malicious intent. The person who refuses to violate someone's rights to stop that bomb from going off isn't responsible for the bomb going off. Now, of course, those thousands of people who will die in the bomb blast also have a right to life. And so you might ask, well, doesn't the person by refusing to torture this one person violate the rights of those people by allowing them to die? There you go. Well, no. When the bomb goes off and thousands of people die, those thousands of people have had their rights violated. Their right to life has been violated. But who's it been violated by? Shouldn't it's been matter, violated right? by the terrorist who planted the bomb. Like the person who refuses to torture the man with the information may have allowed those rights to be violated by the terrorists, but he does not himself violate those rights. Yeah, I just... I'm going to just sound like a broken record here. Action versus inaction doesn't matter. That's all I'm going to say. He simply allows the situation to obtain in which somebody else violates their right by setting off that bomb. But by allowing that situation to obtain, he has not himself violated those rights. So although we may think that from a neutral perspective, so to speak, 
Uh, the situation in which the bomb goes off and thousands of people die is much worse than the situation in which a single person is tortured. We're interested here in moral obligation, and if rights exist and cannot be violated ethically in any circumstance, then the person who is tasked with getting the information from the man who knows where the bomb is, and the only way they can do that is by violating his right not to be tortured, they cannot torture that man. Now, okay, let me link this back to the question at hand. What I'm trying to get across is that in such a situation where, you know, thousands of people are going to die if I don't torture this one individual, if we believe in rights and we believe that rights are inviolable, we would say that it's wrong for me to violate that person's rights regardless of the circumstances, right? It doesn't matter if a bomb's about to go off or a bomb's not about to go off or thousands of people are gonna die or one person's gonna die, whatever. That's irrelevant because rights mean that they cannot be violated. So it doesn't matter what the consequence is. What matters is if I violate someone's rights in any circumstance, I've done something wrong. Now, presumably, it's worse for me to violate two people's rights than to violate one person's right. And this is where I think we can get some clarity on this question. Because if this rights-based perspective really does take no account of the consequence of violating or respecting people's rights, it just says that whatever the circumstance, you need to respect this person's rights because that's what a right is, then presumably the more people's rights are violated, the worse the situation. So in the question, we're asked about the difference between harming one person and thereby probably violating some kind of right that they have to help 10 people and violating 10,000 people's rights to help 100,000 people. Now in the second case, you know, the, the number of people helped has increased, but on this rights-based perspective, we're not taking account of the consequence. We're just taking account of our obligation not to violate the rights of innocent people. So what we essentially have is the difference between violating one person's right and violating 10,000 people's rights. And clearly the situation in which we violate 10,000 people's rights is much worse. So if you're a utilitarian, I think that the calculation comes out the same, right? If you harm one person to save 10 people, or you harm 10,000 people to save 100,000 people, because the proportions are the same, the calculation comes out the same, right? The balance of- Yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, this this is how I'm interpreting the question differently, but I, I, I think I do just disagree with that perspective because the proportion is the same, but the actual net difference is different. And that's what utilitarians care about, especially hedonic utilitarians you know they, they care about the net amount not the proportion i don't think that's right pleasure and pain is the same and so these situations are morally identical but that's because the utilitarian takes into account the consequences but if you believe in rights and the way that i've characterized them that is that they are inviolable no matter the circumstances then i do think it would be worse to harm 10,000 people to save 100,000 people than it would be to harm one person to save 10 people. Because all we really need to take into account, um, insofar as someone's moral obligations are concerned, is if they violate someone's rights, and if so, how many rights do they violate? And in the smaller case, they only violate one person's right. In the larger case, they violate 10,000 people's rights. And we don't take the consequences into account. We just say that you've done something much worse by violating more people's rights than just by violating one person's rights. So if you believe in rights in this way, I think that there would be an ethical difference between these two circumstances. Anyway, you know, there are... No I, I, I'm not super clear whether the case he was putting forward was his own view or whether it was just like steel manning the case that a deontologist would make. It was a bit tricky for me to tell. Um, I think either way I disagree. As I said, a deontologist should still want to minimize the number of rights that are violated. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rehash that. So I, I still disagree even if even with the steel man of um, deontology. Yeah, I, I don't know whether that was that was his views or not. But let me just say that if it was, I'm pretty surprised and just in the context of this whole video, I'm a little bit surprised by Cosmic Skeptic's views on a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty confident he was a deontologist. Uh, sorry, I'm pretty confident he was a utilitarian based on the videos and other things that I've seen him say. So if I'm right and that is his view and he's not just still manning, then I'm, I'm quite surprised, I guess. Yeah, I think I'd, that's how I'd summarize this video. I think apart from the second question, which I mostly agreed with Cosmic Skeptic on, I think just quite surprised by their perspective on these. All right, so he pretty much wraps up the video from there. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, I, I, yeah, just gonna summarize that as disagree with a lot of what he said. Um, Alex, if you're watching this, I'd really love to have a chat with you about this. Um, if only to, I guess, for my benefit mostly to try and understand, maybe if I misinterpreted some of your past work wrong and uh, I, I've got I've got your view wrong because um, my perspective is that 
your answers here in a lot of ways contradict other things you've said previously. I might be misinterpreting something um, either in this content or previous content. Really love to chat with you on this. Yeah, please, please reach out. Um, but for everyone else who is watching, hope you enjoyed. Do you agree with my perspective or uh, more in line with Cosmic Skeptics or something else? Um, be interested here in the comments. I just want to take the, this opportunity to say um, first thank you to everyone who's subscribed so far. I'm pretty, pretty amazed by uh, the, the support I've gotten, especially on a lot of my anti-natalism content has been very popular. Um, so if you enjoyed this or you want to see any, anything similar uh, that I do on my channel, then please, please subscribe. Click the notification icon as well so you can see when videos are released. Like the video or dislike it if you didn't like it, of course. Um, leave a comment on your thoughts. And just one last plug for my podcast, Morality is Hard, which I've started up again recently. So I aim to tackle some different ethical topics in each episode, um, usually interviewing someone on a particular topic. Basically, the main the main theme is that I think morality is harder than people want it to be and finding thinking about the right ethical answer to ethical questions can be hard. Next episode of this podcast is coming out in about the next week and I've interviewed Oscar Orta about wild animal suffering. So um, if you're interested in that, I think you'll love that interview. So you can find the Morality is Hard podcast. You can either get to it via my website, michaeldella.com. You can find it on SoundCloud, iTunes, or uh, most platforms that you can find podcasts on. So thank you again for watching. Hope you enjoyed um, and I'll see you next time.